I do want to talk about confidence and the eight worldly wins because that's the, the theme of the book I wrote. So I thought the best way to get into it um, might actually just be to read a page and a half from the introduction because I think it sums it up. So uh, this is called Encountering Our Fragility, the Eight Worldly Wins. Have you ever been by a car wash or car dealership and seen those inflatable people, they're often called tube men, who come to life when the wind picks up and wave at all passers-by like everything in the universe is amazing, only to droop in despair when the animating breeze leaves them? One moment the tube man is on top of the world, and the next he looks like he thinks he's the worst piece of shit who ever existed. If we're going to have a real conversation about confidence, we have to admit we each have one of these little tube people inside of us. We're sensitive to the tiniest signals of positive or negative feedback from the world. Someone cute smiles at you and everything is golden. You get a text message containing one offhand criticism and every drop of sunshine leaves the world. The winds are constantly blowing and they prop us up with superficial perceptions of self-worth only to knock us down into gloom when one contradictory experience rips through. If you've been around the block a few times, you know that no matter what you do, no matter how you try to protect yourself, the next contrary experience is always coming. In classic Buddhism, these forces that both inflate and deflate our self-regard are sometimes called the vicissitudes, but they often go by an appropriate metaphor, the eight worldly winds. They're known as winds because whenever we become attached to some plateau of stillness or ease, these experiences can knock us off balance. They can also be thought of as eight traps of hope and fear, traps we face constantly because they're moments we either chase after or brace against. Siddhartha Gautama, the historical Buddha, categorized these eight into four couplets, in which one side represents our elation, or hope, and the other side our deflation, or fear, or in more extreme moments, our deepest fantasies and darkest nightmares. This framework is both ancient and timeless, because even as culture evolves and technology accelerates, not much has changed in the existential terrain of the human heart. Throughout history, other experts of the human mind have also tried to elaborate ways to describe the things we all long for, such as psychologist Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which does have some surprising parallels with the eight worldly winds that Gautama talked of 2,500 years ago. These are the four pairs of worldly winds the Buddha described, with the first of each pair describing the experience we reach towards or hope for, and the second describing the experience we desperately try to avoid or fear. So the first uh, pairing is pleasure and pain. The second is praise and criticism. The third is fame or influence and insignificance. Uh, and the last is success and failure, most generally. Sometimes that one is just called gain and loss. So, um, I've always been really interested in this list of Buddhist teachings, and um, this is actually the fourth book that I've written about Buddhism, and um, where this book came from is I have the opportunity to work with a lot of people in, in group settings uh, like this, uh, uh, three, not always 300 uh, beautiful strangers in little two-dimensional boxes, but group settings. Uh, and I often work with people one on one uh, and not just about their meditation practice, but also uh, studying the depths of Buddhist philosophy and, and psychology and also thinking about how we face the challenges of life in a, a mindful and compassionate way using these principles and teachings and uh, it seems like whenever uh, we go just slightly below the surface about an interest in mindfulness or meditation, uh, the conversation is always about, you know, how do I show up fully? And how do I show up fully when it's hard, right? And how do I show up fully when life is 
knocking me around, which that's why I like uh, this list of eight. Uh, I don't know if you have Sharon Salzberg, who's one of my friends and teachers, um, usually uh, refers to them as the vicissitudes. Uh, and uh, they've also sometimes been called the eight worldly dharmas. Dharma there meaning phenomena or event, not truth or teaching. Dharma has multiple meanings, uh, but worldly wins, right? They, you're sitting here trying to be with yourself, trying to be a decent human amongst other humans and cats. Some of you have noticed my cat, Belle. Um, and, uh, and life knocks you around. And these experiences uh, knock you around. I'll say them again, uh, and I bet some of you have already heard them. So the, the first pair, which is the most uh, visceral and kind of the most tied to our physical experience and our nervous system is pleasure and pain, right? So pleasure and the possibility of pleasure elates us. We hope for it. We long for it. Uh, pain uh, uh, knocks us down, right? We cringe against it. We brace. Um, so pleasure and pain is the first pair. Um, then from there, it gets more into our uh, psychological and our relational identity, right? Um, so uh, how do we relate to other people? Mostly through our regard for them. Um, and uh, our, um, how we are regarded by them, right? If, if they like us, if they praise us, if they don't like us or don't like our work, if they criticize us, so that's praise and blame or praise and criticism, right? Somebody says something kind, uh, they give your book uh, five stars, ooh, that ooh, feels like pleasure, right? Their, their relational uh, regard for you increased and, and it inflates you just like that uh, tube person outside of the, the car wash. I love those guys. And since this book has been out for about a month and friends have been sending me pictures, I didn't, you, you never realize when you use a metaphor in your book that everybody's gonna consider that like your metaphor. So people have been, friends have been sending me pictures every time they've seen one of these two people uh, outside and, and y'all are welcome to email me your your two people pictures if you like right so somebody says something kind it brings us up somebody says something offhandedly critical or very critical it knocks us over like a wind right um the third one is um our desire to have a and this one might be something that you long for it might be uh something that uh, you have less relationship to, but it's where our desire for recognition becomes a desire to be known, right? Known in a social circle, known in a community, known in a society, right? So um, uh, typically this one is called fame, right? And um, I, using the term uh, influencer, the modern term for, for fame, talked about what we really want here is either recognition or influence over a social group. We want a platform. We want to be seen. We want to be regarded a certain way. And the reverse of this is um, there's two reverses of it. In, in one of the lists, uh, you will find the reverse of this is infamy or disrepute. Um, the interesting thing about the era that we live in is that our media and social media has helped people figure out how to use infamy as another form of fame, right? To be a controversial, controversial person can actually be uh, just as powerful, it can give you just as much powerful power as being uh, a famous person. So the I really tend towards the other feared element of this pair uh, which rather than being infamy is insignificance, being alone and unknown, no microphone, we're cutting the microphone off, speaking of nobody in particular in our political lives, um, insignificance. 
did I spell that right? Um, fame and insignificance, right? Uh, so that might be one that you have some relationship to. It often comes up when we're trying to put our work or some way of being seen in the world out more broadly. It may not, that one may not be quite as relevant to you right now uh, in your life. And then the most overarching or generalized one about our social and sense of self, you could say, uh, is uh, either called success and failure, or in some lists you see this called uh, gain and loss, right? So whatever the project is, right? A successful meditation practice, don't we all long for that? Even though we don't quite know what we are even longing for, does that mean more concentration? Uh, does that mean uh, more kindness and open heartedness flowing from our practice? Does that mean we do it every day? Uh, what does that mean? Meditation with no bodily pain, right? Don't we all long for that? What does it mean to fail in our sitting practice, right? What does it mean to succeed in a relationship, right? Uh, not one that the historical Buddha was uh, at least not intimate relationship wasn't wasn't his particular bag, but um, it could be what we're trying to uh, apply our our practice to, right? What would that mean? What does it mean to fail, right? Uh, somebody talked about uh, you know purchasing or getting a new home. I talked about success and failure with just traveling, right? Um, and uh, Yes, the, the two men do, they're, they're not natural winds uh, blowing them. Good, good, good catch, Steve. But I love the, the feeling uh, of, of the emotional feeling of just watching them go, yay! And then when that wind leaves and they just droop over, it really feels like you're watching uh, the collapse, right? And life can feel that way sometimes, right? Sometimes right after we succeed i tell a funny story in the uh success and uh failure chapter of the book of the day that i actually had the most verified success i've ever had as a writer uh and had just sort of that best sense of yes i made it i'm a writer i've always wanted to be a, a writer and then i got news that a writer who was a friend of mine who I actually respect quite a lot, uh, succeeded even more than, than I did on the same day, right? And then there was a moment of like, oh, shucks, right? So we're constantly in these modes of getting elated and deflated, right? And so typically, if you look at uh, classic Buddhist teachings, especially coming from the Theravadan tradition, meaning the the Theravada literally mean old school. It's, it refers to the schools of Buddhism. Uh, for those of you who don't know that really um, focus on the meditative practices and lists that come out of the earliest uh, discourses, the, the discourses that are directly linked to the life of the Buddha. So in Theravadan Buddhism, uh, this uh, the the quality that helps us sort of work with these winds hold our seat you could say is usually translated as well it's in non-translated it's either upeka in the pali language or upeksha in the sanskrit language and that usually translates does anybody know how that word gets most commonly translated Happiness, it's an E word. It's this confusing uh, E word. It usually gets translated as equanimity. Have people heard that? It's, it's the one of the four Brahma Viharas or uh, qualities. And this, uh, I've noticed that when you say equanimity as a quality of how to hold one's seat in all the ways that hope and fear knocks us all around, um, there is a... Um, a feeling of uh, I'm supposed to be I'm supposed to be more impervious to these winds, right? If I really, really gained skill as a practitioner, it wouldn't matter so much if the offer on the house was accepted uh, 
or not, right? It wouldn't matter so much if I made my plane to Chicago tomorrow or not. I just wouldn't, it would, just wouldn't, you know, I'd, who cares? It's just a plane, right? It's just a, it's just a house. Um, I think that what we're really talking about here could be better described as resilience or confidence. Like, how do we actually uh, work uh, with a with a uh, grounded and open-hearted consciousness in a world where we are constantly being hit by the experiences of being a human amongst other human beings, right? How do we actually acknowledge the way things affect us, but actually show up to them anyway, more fully? And I, there's a story that I'd like to tell about the, the research around meditation uh, that is related to the, the first of these um, pairs, which is pleasure and pain. And there's something that's so important in Buddhist terms about mindfulness of pleasure and pain, because the logic of um, how our mind responds and how mindfulness helps us respond to pleasure and pain uh, really carries forth into the logic of the other uh, pairs. What I mean by that is if we understand pleasure and pain then we understand that praise and criticism are like pleasure and pain. Success and failure are like pleasure and pain in terms of how our system experiences them. <clears throat> so there was, um, there was uh, an experiment done uh, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, a, a series of experiments, and, and they're overseen by a man named uh, Richard or Richie Davidson, uh, who some of you may be familiar with. He's probably the foremost neuroscientist studying the effects of uh, meditation on the brain. And this was uh, a pain receptor experiment. So what they were looking at was how does mindfulness practice and how does the, the meditative state shift a person's relationship to pain? to the experience of physical pain, not emotional pain, not, uh, you know, my screenplay got rejected pain, not we lost, you know, our offer on the house uh, didn't, uh, didn't get accepted pain, but physical pain. And so they set up this 30 second experiment where they uh, monitored the pain receptor activity in the brain. And the way the experiment was set up is they had, I believe these uh, burning plates, these metal plates that they could uh, take to very high temperatures very quickly and cool off very quickly. So it would deliver a, a legitimate burning sensation. It was painful, but it wouldn't, um, uh, it, it wouldn't cause any permanent damage to the skin. It wouldn't leave a burn, and that was important. So it was a painful experience without a damaging outcome. So, but the way they set up the experiment is the painful sensation only lasted for 10 seconds, but they monitored the pain receptors for 30 seconds. So the way they set up this experiment is at the very beginning of the experiment, they said, soon you will experience a painful sensation, right? Then 10 seconds after that, the pain actually started. And then 10 seconds after that, at second 20, the pain actually ended, but they keep monitoring for 10 more seconds to see the pain receptor activity. So basically they set up these three phases of how we experience physical pain. The, the anticipation or the bracing against pain that we expect to come, the actual experience, and then the reflection or perseveration against that pain, right? So they had, uh, non-meditators and they're the master meditator who I call in the book the Jedi of mindfulness sorry for being of the Star Wars generation but um, uh, was a, a Tibetan Lama you may have heard of uh, named Yongi Mingyur uh, Rinpoche who wrote the book in love with the world really wonderful memoir um, so he had done uh, the most hours of mindfulness in his life and he, he represented the master meditator, and then they had 
people who are somewhat experienced in meditation and then total novices. So basically what happened was people who had never practiced mindfulness before, it was 30 seconds of pain receptor activity. So as soon as the technician said, soon you will experience a burning sensation, they were in some state of anticipatory pain. It went up a little bit during the actual painful experience. And it came down a little bit during the last 10 seconds when they were reflecting on the pain, but pretty much they were in pain for all 30 seconds. Okay, so I'm at a lecture and and this is also described in a book called uh, Altered Traits, which Richie Davidson wrote with uh, Daniel Goleman. Um, but I'm at the lecture with hearing uh, Richie Davidson talk about this, and he claims to be surprised by the results of the master meditator, Mingyu Rinpoche. So what happened to the pain experiment of, of Mingyu Rinpoche? Um, what you may not be surprised by in any way is that uh, he had almost no anticipatory pain, right? So the technician said, soon you will experience a painful sensation and pretty much nothing happened in his pain receptors like very minimal and after the pain went away he returned to baseline very very quickly but what about the actual pain uh the actual 10 seconds where the burning sensation was being applied what happened in Mingyur Rinpoche's brain during that time and this is really interesting because I think it's a whole key to understanding our experience of the winds of life. Can anybody guess what, what the master meditator, the so-called Jedi of mindfulness experience during uh, the, the painful, during the, the burning pain? Yeah, so we have, uh, he felt better, well, peace of mind, higher, more painful, so, his pain receptor activity spiked higher than the control group, than the novice meditators. In other words, during, during the painful experience, he felt the pain more. But again, nothing before, and he returned to baseline very quickly. So this is really interesting about uh, what meditation does, is uh, it makes us feel our experience more, right? Uh, that may sound like a bummer, right? I, I joke in the book, like, if you hired a modern day Don Draper, if you know who Don Draper was, the ad executive from the show Mad Men, you know, to sell subscriptions to the Calm app, you know, probably wouldn't be a good promo line to say, feel pain more, <laughs> practice meditation, right? Um, but that is what the master meditator felt. Now, he didn't feel pain before or after right but he felt what was happening fully that's the point he felt the wind hitting him but he was there with it it didn't knock him off it didn't have extra effect after the fact now i you could imagine them doing a pleasure uh meditation like eating you know a great dessert or something like that right and he would probably also feel the pleasure more than the control group while it was happening. So that's probably the trade off. But the point here that I think is super important is if we think that the other winds operate on the same sort of logic as pleasure and pain, then it would also stand to reason that if if um, you hope for something, you're going to feel that fully. And if you fear something, you're going to feel that fully. You know, this has been a very interesting uh, process for me. I, the reason I use the airport, I, I'm in airports a lot, actually. I travel uh, a fair uh, amount. Uh, don't always feel good about the, the carbon footprint associated with that. I'll say that. Um, that might be the, the, the perseverating pain after the fact. But one thing I've noticed about myself is I always have anxiety in airports. There's just always a certain hope, fear, uh, you know, I like to get to airports early. I like to get through security. I got the TSA pre-clearance so that it would be a little bit smoother. You know, anxiety sort of 
is there, right? And I've med- meditated for, you know, at this point, I'm, you know, almost 30 years consistently that, that my practice has since being a teenager that, that it's been consistent. That hasn't really changed, you know? Like there's still that experience of, of uh, moderate anxiety and moderate, I hope I make it, right? What has changed is I can, I have a lot more confidence that I know my own mind and I know how to work with it, right? So that the anxiety is only happening and I'm like, yep, oh, what am I anxious about? Oh, yep, I'm on my way to the airport. Okay, yeah, this is that, right, this is me. This is my mind. This is this is the world that I inhabit. And what has shifted is that uh, I can uh, inhabit that experience more fully, right? So I think that that uh, a, a word for this whole practice of actually working with hope and fear in our experience uh, is what I'm calling the practice of confidence. And I don't, I didn't want to write a book uh, about Buddhist teachings on confidence, claiming that it was going to like, you know, from a sort of alpha male perspective, we could say, where we might make the claim, I have confidence and go get them, you know, the world is yours, you know, well, first of all, I believe the world is everybody's, right? Um, But I also think that confidence is a practice, right? And it's a practice of working with hope and fear. And just like the pain experiment shows, the more awake we get, the more present we get with our experience of hope and fear, right? So I think that's really important to view confidence as a practice and to view the ways that life strikes us, both the pleasant and the painful, both the hopeful and the fearful, as one, just part of the human experience, and as things that we are increasing our awareness of and increasing our sensitivity to. Uh, yes, in, in, in prepping for this book, I was interested in looking into people like Tony Robbins to see how they were manifesting and presenting uh, confidence. It was, that was an interesting, that was an interesting uh, process for sure. Um, so the second half of the book, I talk about uh, some of the teachings that are coming at what is called the four powers of confidence and talk about some ideas for uh, supports we can have for, for building more confidence. But I think, you know, whether or not you want to, um, uh, you know, uh, pick up the book or not, the key piece that I wanted to just offer as the nugget of wisdom is the same nugget of wisdom that's coming out of that pain experience, which is the winds of hope and fear, the eight worldly winds, they are intrinsic to being a human being. They're not going anywhere, right? We're not going to um, uh, get away from those. Uh, And what we're trying to do with our practice is become more open-hearted and more recognizing of those so that we can transform our relationship to them, you know? So, um, yeah, I, I doubt there will ever be a moment where I don't get a little anxious in an airport, right? But uh, you might not know that that's what happens to me unless I talk about it, you know? So um, anyway, those are my, my thoughts for the evening. Uh, if anybody is, because uh, I know some people pop off in discussion, but uh, I'm, I'm here for the next 20 or so minutes. I'd love to have a discussion or answer questions. I'm just gonna pop a few links uh, in there. The The main title of the book is Confidence. You can, wherever you like to get your books, it's at the first link. And if you wanna check out some of the courses uh, that I teach online, you can go to dharmamoon.com. Uh, you can also just shoot me an email uh, if you wanna um, just say a few words uh, at the link at, oops, um, sorry, I put that. Let me, let me do that again. Here are the links. Uh, EthanNickTurn.com, Confidence is the book link, and uh, DharmaMoon.com uh, for uh, uh, courses, uh, online courses that I teach. Um, I see Isabel has a, a hand raised. My daughter's name is Isabella, but she goes by Izzy. So 
It's nice to meet uh, uh, yes, Isabel. Nice you too. Such a great talk and one of my favorite subjects. And I, I is your cat Bella? So your daughter's Isabella and your cat's Bella? Oh, I, I don't need to take up your time, but seven-year-olds can really throw shade. So we adopted this cat. The cat was originally going to be Wednesday after Wednesday Adams. But then Belle, who's uh, one of the minor Disney princesses, Izzy comes home and she's like, the cat's going to be named Belle. <laughs> and I was like, but Izzy, that's a little close to your name, Isabella. I think at some point she might not want to be Izzy. She might want to be Bella. And she goes to me, no, dad, uh, it's I'm Isabella with an A. This would be Belle with an E. Oh. Totally different. And I was like, all right. So, you know, I stand corrected. So yes. anyway, what's I'll, on your mind? So probably get over being Izzy like I did at one point. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I just wanted to say that uh, this weekend I saw out, uh, Inside Out. Yeah, I did too. Yeah. yeah, right. And so like it's all about anxiety, which I share a, a gene. My whole family has the anxiety gene, we say. Yeah. And it was so great. It was just like what you said, that once you know your relationship with anxiety for example and that's what that that movie really for days afterwards i've been thinking every time i feel anxious that i see that little that face the 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 character and i remember that it's and i knew this before i saw the movie that it's a tool to help you through life but but it, it gets hyped up and it and it interferes and it makes messes just like the character in the movie and just seeing it like that really helped me to relate to my anxiety in a different way, just like what you're talking about in terms of the eight wins and understanding, you know, what triggers are, you know, whatever, anxiety or fear. Or... Yeah. I just wanted to yeah. share that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Inside Out. So uh, Inside Out uh, 2, uh, which is the a Pixar movie, uh, the, these movies are are based on the I believe they're primarily based on the modeling of emotions uh, developed by Paul Ekman. Uh, and um, yeah, in the second one, you're in the mind of this girl. And in the second one, she's turning 14. She's really into ice hockey. And uh, anxiety comes in and basically takes over and kicks all of the other emotions out and tries to become sort of like a benevolent dictator to keep the girl safe, you know, and have a plan for everything. And so what I love about these movies is that there is a real portrayal of what in the Shambhala and Tibetan teachings uh, might be called um, the basic goodness of emotions, right? And this is, you know, internal family systems is a model of Western therapy that has a very similar approach of what if we actually just held our mental experiences with a little bit of appreciation, like that they are actually, uh, they're not just harmful, um, you know, infestations. They actually have wisdom. They're, they're trying to help. They're trying to keep us safe. Uh, and that's one of the things I love about tantric or sometimes called Vajrayana or, uh, you know, mostly known as Tibetan Buddhism is this, these ways of mapping uh, visually and ceremonially uh, emotions as not just uh, confusion or what could be called klesha uh, in the Sanskrit language, but as sort of having uh, real wisdom to them, you know, and uh, hope and fear have real wisdom to them. But again, if we don't have a, uh, a, an awakened relationship to our emotions, they can their, their functionality can become destructive, right? And that's basically what happens with anxiety is it doesn't leave space for the other emotions to kind of co-create a compassion itself and, um, and kind of becomes a dictator, right? And it's a, it's a pretty beautiful, I thought it was a pretty beautiful um, movie anyway. And, and it's beautiful because ki the kids who see it uh, can start to, um, and maybe the cats who see it, um, can start to um, uh, really have a playfulness with naming their emotions, right? Um, sometimes Izzy will say, my brain is telling me X, which I think is such lovely language because it's not making it like, this is me and I'm a bad person for having this experience. It's like, I'm actually in dialogue 
uh, with my own brain, my own mind. And that, what a wonderful way to think about it. So I think confidence is about being in dialogue with our hope and our fear and showing up with that, you know? So, yeah, thank you. So uh, what role do motivation and deeper connection to insight um, have to the eight worldly winds? You know, I think uh, to be a, to, to my mind, uh, I think, uh, do you pronounce your name Uli? Or is it Uli or Uli? Um, you can correct me, please. Um, uh, to, to my uh, mind, uh, the, the point of being a Buddhist practitioner is that whatever happens to us in life, we are trying to gain insight from it, right? In other words, yes, we do long for, for certain things, you know, like we do long, if you have a longing to buy this house, that's your hope. You can't really do anything about that other than experience it and, and pursue it. If you have a longing for a relationship, uh, you know, then that's your hope. That's your longing. But I think the idea of being a Dharma practitioner is that whatever happens to us in life, what we're really trying to do is gain greater insight and wisdom from it. So there's a superficial way of meeting the eight worldly wins, which is just, I need to get this success, avoid this failure. I need pleasure. I need to avoid pain. And that keeps everything on the surface without a lot of insight. Whereas if you say, oh, I'm going to use this experience of a relationship, or I'm going to use this experience of trying to enter an American real estate market, which it can be seriously hope and fear inducing, um, to try to gain further insight into my own heart and mind. And that motivation for deeper wisdom is going to be the reason that I engage in conventional activities. Then we're, we're uh, operating on a much deeper level. Like everything is about awakening. And that doesn't mean uh, to be a worldly practitioner for me it, it doesn't mean you abandon the affairs of the world. It means that we use the affairs of the world to say, what's my real motivation here, right? What's my real motivation in this relationship? I want to learn more about being human. I want to awaken a little bit more. So it's not just, you know, I think that's the other thing about a Buddhist approach to confidence. It's not just getting what we want, right? Um, getting what we want is not, it, it doesn't do it on a deeper level. Um, but what does do it on a deeper level is whether I get what I want or not in this particular instance, can I harvest greater insight about my heart and mind, about the truth of who I am, the truth of interdependence, the truth that all things change, et cetera. And can I use the events of my life and the hopes and fears of my life as kind of a harvesting of insight. And then I think our intention becomes a lot deeper. Um, so that's the way I think of it, that there's a superficial way to relate to the eight worldly winds, and then there's an awakened way to relate to the eight worldly winds. But either way, the eight worldly winds are gonna be there. That's, I think, the key piece. You can't get away from the eight worldly winds. If you have airport anxiety, your, your um, relationship to it will probably change, but you will still be a human, a human trying to get to his plane, right? <laughs> that part happens no matter what. Um, yeah. Yeah, self-worth um, to confidence. Yeah, I thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I think, you know, the, 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 piece that I focused on in the introduction of the book is this question of if there's no self, um, how can there be self-confidence, right? And I think people get hung up on the idea that there is no solid self, that we are always changing, that we exist in different contexts, right? That there's nothing solid uh, about our experience uh, and people sometimes get hung up on that and say, well, what's the point in focusing on your self-identity at all? 
And the experience of non-self, when we really look into what that feels like, is an experience of uh, positive regard to oneself. Um, it is an experience of our own basic goodness, right? Our own um, worthiness, you know? Like the, when the Buddha actually attained awakening, there was a sense, you know, when he touches the earth, everybody has seen that, the, the mudra of his right hand, the bhumi sparsha, which literally means earth or ground, touching gesture. He's basically saying, I'm here and I'm worthy to be here, right? Uh, and that's the expression of his experience of the interdependent and um, ephemeral nature of himself and all things, right? And uh, so I do think we need to have a sense of, I belong here. And it's even said in the, uh, the Shambhala teachings, which I studied, that when a person sits down to meditate, they should have the sense of dignity of a king or queen of an enlightened society sitting on their throne, right? That's pretty badass when it comes to a sense of confidence and self-worth, right? That, that there's, we don't have to feel like a king or queen. I don't actually believe in king or queens. I'm, I'm into democracy myself, but um, that sense of like, I belong here um, is, is such a, it's such a hard to experience, but really beautiful a part of this practice. And so I think that's why uh, loving kindness meditation uh, is so important. I think that's why people like uh, Kristen Neff and Christopher Germer have really focused on self-compassion as practice rather than uh, just focusing on compassion towards uh, others. Um, and I think, I think uh, positive self-regard and a sense of your own basic goodness is the experience of non-self ironically so yeah more praise uh yeah pema children all emotions when held skillfully carry a core of wisdom that's the basic idea of wisdom emotions very very important concept any other questions specifically? Did I miss one in the chat? Um, Ethan, there was one by Tommy at 724. I don't know if you want to speak to it. Oh, yeah. Isn't longing, uh, having quality, oh, yeah. grasping and attachment. Um, so I don't know if you'd like to speak to that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, this is This is the tricky piece, right? So uh I, attachment is an interesting word in english because you know i don't often use that word pejoratively the way some earlier buddhist translations do because attachment can just be a style of relationship um whereas grasping i think demonstrates like we're holding on to something there's almost like a paralysis like i need this it needs to be this way right and same way, fear can have a quality of pushing away, which is different from just like, ah, this doesn't feel good, right? It's like, I need this to not exist, right? Mm -hmm. And so hope and fear, can that this is their danger, right? Is they can very easily induce that response of not just, I want this, you know, um, I want this, you know, I want whatever it is whatever it is that you want there's a part of the heart that just goes this is what it is i want this and then something comes in that we can almost watch come in and go i need oh, i gotta have right i mean you know chocolate chip cookies are a good way for me to gauge that that fine line between oh cookies are so wonderful it's what a wonderful manifestation to you know argh, you know and same thing, same thing with the other side. That sort of like, God, pain hurts. Pain hurts, right? To, oh, I cannot, I can't, I can't even talk to that person because 
they piss me off too much, it hurts too much, right? And it goes to like pushing experience away. But I think in the in the basic experience of the wind, that's why I like the word longing, because to me, the word longing doesn't have necessarily that connotation of grasping. And before there's a grasping, there's just the, I want, you know? And then it can, the mind, the confused, the unaware mind can very quickly turn that into, but I gotta have it, you know? And so that is a danger, right? That is. And so what you're talking about, bodhicitta, the awakened heart, which is a term from common to all schools, especially of uh, Mahayana Buddhism. Chitta literally means mind, but heart and mind are often used interchangeably. Um, so that bodhicitta is the sort of wanting the the awakening, wanting the goodness of all beings to be manifest. So it kind of comes in and it it is a form of love that softens the grasping and softens the rejecting on the other side, right? But I do think the the hope and fear in their rawest form are innocent, right? You're, it's just how life strikes you, you know? And you can pretend not to want what you want, but there it is. You know, we can try to suppress it, right? We can try to say, no, I'm a Dharma practitioner, I'm a meditator, I don't want that. Usually what comes in there is the word should and should not, right? And oftentimes you hear people saying, I know I shouldn't be afraid of this. I know I shouldn't want this. And it's like, no, it's just, I want, I'm afraid of, you know? So, but you're absolutely right. They can very quickly without mindfulness turn into grasping and rejecting. Yeah. All right. So I think it's ab about time to begin to close, yeah? It is. We usually close at 7:30. So you're you're right on the you're right on the dime. Wonderful. Well, I'm just putting the link to my website and book up one more time if you missed it and um, feel free to be in touch um, anytime. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think uh, should we, sometimes in my tradition, we just have a moment of contemplating the merit of our practice and gathering and just having a sense of offering that to our own future development and um, to the benefit and awakening of all. So just take a moment, any insight that's arisen for you from your own practice tonight, from the effort of it, you can just imagine that that insight is growing within you and benefiting your, your state of mind, your behaviors, the way you express yourself, and that that benefit is also touching others in all directions. One very simple dedication of merit that I heard Thich Nhat Hanh say once is simply, may the fruit of our practice be for the benefit of all beings. May the fruit of our practice be for the benefit of all beings. Mm -hmm.